Welcome to Inside City Hall, the show where we take a closer look at your city government through the lens of its boards and commissions. In this show, we'll meet the volunteer commissioners and board members who provide expertise and guidance in critical decision making that affects our community. Journey with us as we take an insider's look into the legislative process. Welcome to another episode of Inside City Hall. I'm Autumn King, your host. In this episode today, we are going to meet members of the Privacy Advisory Commission. We are joined today by Chairman Brian Hofer, Commissioner Reem Suleiman, Commissioner Henry Gage, and City Staff Member Joe DeVries. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate you taking some time out this morning to chat with us. One of the things that we talk about on this show is your role within the commission itself. Before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about the actual commission. It, it, the genesis of the entire commission came out, out of a 2014 project, the Domain Awareness Center. And at that time, uh, Oakland had no publicly available uh, privacy policies. There was no real citizen input. Uh, and the project really caught the public off guard. Uh, city staff had been working on it for a number of years, uh, you know, with each other, with various departments, fire, police, support of Oakland, but there was no real citizen engagement or outreach, like, do you guys even want this thing? And it hit the public safety committee agenda in June 2013, two weeks after, you know, some unknown guy now known, now called Edward Snowden hit the front pages, so not great timing. And just immediately a lot of alarm bells went off. We had Occupy Oakland a year prior to that and some Urban Shield protests. So there's still a lot of um, conflict, a lot of energy. And, and uh, it certainly showed up at City Hall when people started showing up to protest that. And out of that uh, activism, out of that campaign, they created a temporary ad hoc committee that Joe and I were part of and we convinced the city council to make a, a standing committee. And it was essentially based on the, the premise that we know there's gonna be more and more technology coming mm -hmm. forward all the time and that we needed a vetting framework. Like how are we gonna draw the guidelines around it? Uh, what data we collect, who we share it with? Is this too invasive? Uh, like our recent facial recognition discussion. And um, just really about putting a framework in place for citizen input into really, um, their own government. And so one of, I know I read your um, <coughs> mission in the, in the details of the commission, part of it, you're charged with providing advice and technical assistance to the city on best practices to protect Oaklanders' privacy. What does that mean? What privacy of mine are you trying to protect? Some of the recent work we've been doing, let's take ShotSpotter for example. You have a gunshot location detection system that the police department wants to use to respond quickly to the scene of a firearms discharge. Now that seems to be a pretty righteous need. You want your public safety officers to show up when firearms are set off in a city. Mm -hmm. You want them to gather evidence. You want them to conduct investigations. You want them to follow up to make sure that something happens if someone's shot, someone's injured, or, or weapons negligently discharged. However, when you establish systems like that, when you start putting microphones up on telephone poles or on the sides of buildings, even though your desire might be to capture the sound of a gunshot, there's a very real risk that that system can be turned around and used for much more coercive means. Part of our job is to make sure that technology that the department, in this case the police, mm -hmm. wants to use to protect the public does exactly that and nothing more. We don't want ShotSpotter to be used as a mass surveillance system. We don't want the police department using microphones to listen in on criminal suspects. We do want the police department to show up and to collect evidence. And balancing those competing concerns is kind of the bread and butter of this commission. So what does that balance look like? 
I think ShotSpotter is an excellent example. How do you balance my privacy? How, how, do, how, how am I assured that walking my dog and having a conversation on my phone is not picked up on the same pole where when the gunshot goes off, it, it's, it's registered there? So one of the things that we do, we, we are constantly looking for ways to future-proof technology. You know, a lot of times the city is using these for very, uh, to answer very concrete needs. Right, but we are answering questions like, how long is the data going to be stored? Can mm. ShotSpotter, for example, collect other audio? How long is it recording for? And so uh, we're limiting the s specifics on what kind of data can be collected and for how long it can remain, and making sure that the data that is stored is, is stored securely and that only the people that need to have access to it uh, have that access. So placing in those safeguards to really future-proof that technology from being misused in the future. I really like that term, future-proof. Mm -hmm. So what research or what are you all doing to get you equipped? Um, how do you prepare to future-proof and advise people on future-proofing for these systems? Uh, well, I think from my position as a staff is really bringing the, the groups together and to make privacy a priority uh, in, in your thought process. So uh, if you have a framework that, that takes privacy into account and asks what can this technology do or what can any technology do, uh, it really doesn't matter what comes in the future if you have a framework mm -hmm. that, that makes that assessment. And so uh, bringing the police or, or fire department or Department of Transportation or any department that wants to use this technology in front of the commission, it gets their staff thinking about uh, privacy as a, as a primary component uh, to, to the use policy, to how they use it. So we don't want to just train staff on how to use the device. We mm -hmm. want to train staff to how to use the device with privacy in mind. Uh, and, and by doing it, by, by laying that groundwork, it really doesn't matter what comes in the future, we're going to be prepared for it. And what trends do you see moving towards the future? I think the Internet of Things, uh, certainly uh, sensors that tell us where parking spaces are available, cameras on, on light poles that tell us how traffic is flowing, uh, recent meeting, uh, the fire department using uh, uh, iPads to take pictures of, of vegetation uh, for inspection purposes, but they're, they're taking those pictures at your home, mm -hmm. which is a private place. And so uh, everything is getting wired to the internet. Uh, everything has data and a cloud, and, and all of that is, is subject to, to uh, being impacted and, and the data being shared. And that's, that's really, um, that's where we're going. That's where we are, and that's where we're going to continue to go. We're about to take a break, and I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable. I'm starting to wonder if I should be nervous. And so I'd love to, as we move into the next segment, to start having conversation about what we as residents should understand about what our city government is doing. You'll Let me put you at ease a little bit. Okay. In that Oakland is one of few cities in the country really leading the way in terms of building in privacy from the design, right, and uh, from the very onset of the city's use of certain technologies. And so, you know, obviously things are not perfect and we have a huge backlog of surveillance technology to review and create policies for, uh, but there is an input process which a lot of places in the country don't have. And so, in a way, we're really lucky to have that here. I'm really glad you brought that up, Reem. So as we get ready to move into our break right now, I'd love to come back and have more conversation about that. Oakland really is leading the way in a lot of different areas, and I would love for you to share a little bit more about that. We're going to take a break right now. Come back and join us for the next segment of Inside City Hall. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. Today we're talking to the members of the Privacy Advisory Commission. Right before break, Reem was telling me to relax and that I did not need to be so nervous about some of the things that they're doing. Reem, can you tell me a little bit more about your connection with other agencies, the federal government, the state government? How does your commission and just in general privacy advocates law tie into the larger scheme of our, of our community? 
One of the uh, other areas of work that the Commission work, uh, deals with that maybe is less known than obviously uh, dealing with surveillance technology is we have an ordinance that about transparency with federal agencies and so we do examine our relationship and our collaboration with other uh, federal agencies to make sure that, that it's in the spirit and in value with the city of Oakland and so an example of something that uh, that happened in 2017 uh, I believe uh, we decided to we, we push forward an initiative to end the MOU between Oakland and ICE uh, because it, we felt it was not in line with our values and so these are things that we are challenging and examining and even though it may not necessarily be as obvious or explicit as a, a video camera hung up on a street or a shot spotter like Henry uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it still is a surveillance issue if that mm -hmm. makes sense. No, very much. Brian, jump in and tell us a little bit about um, S the facial recognition. I know that we hear about big things like facial recognition, shot spotter. Tell us a little bit about facial recognition, but then also, can you point to lesser examples of you protecting our privacy that we might not know about? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, a surveillance equipment ordinance that is now law in seven places in California. And San Francisco was the first one to ban facial recognition. We did it a couple weeks later. Berkeley's now joined. There's a handful of other cities across the country. And it was the first time under this model that we ever just drew a, a, a bright line and said you can't use this technology at all under no circumstances. Usually we confine it. We mm -hmm. restrict the use, we narrow the use a bit, but it's been able to go forward. And for most of us, it was just the, the creepiness factor that this one technology is a lot more invasive than anything else that's been developed recently. And because the camera networks are already in place everywhere, right? We walk past thousands of cameras every day that you really just need to apply the software and you could have mm -hmm. a perfect mass surveillance system. And so that's why uh, we joined San Francisco and others in prohibiting that use. Um, when Oakland's ordinance was adopted, uh, it was the gold standard in the country. We were the first to prohibit non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, the Oakland Police Department had acquired a Stingray, which tracks cell phones, in uh, 2006. We found out in March of 2014. Uh, they didn't even tell the city attorney that they had this thing. Um, so there's, you know, definitely been a lot of controversy around that piece of equipment across the country. Um, and we now do use it, but under a really, really tight use policy with a lot of reporting requirements so that we can monitor it. And use has greatly narrowed. Actually, in this last year during the annual report, they didn't use it at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's <coughs> been something where we've had a pretty significant impact. Um, we also had enhanced whistleblower protections in our ordinance that others are now modeling. So it's pretty much the the language that we've adopted here is now being used by cities across the country as the standard. And I think because of our success and, and really the success with the Privacy Commission involved inside that model itself, um, we've had a, a lot of impact on other jurisdictions that are trying to do what we're doing. I think that's a very good point to, to, to note that Oakland has been the torchbearer in a lot of different situations. Henry, tell me a little bit about what your vision is for the city of Oakland in relation to national privacy acts and in, in relationship to where you see the trends of the nation going. What should Oakland jump on board with or completely steer clear of? In a larger sense, privacy rights and the rights to personally identifiable information are going to be a huge area of one potential litigation moving forward, but also a need to enact new civil rights protections. Mm -hmm. People need to start thinking about their personal data as their property in a way that people currently aren't thinking about it. If someone decides that they want to clip a rose off a bush in front of your house, people understand that as a taking, but we give up so much of our personal information on such a regular basis that people have a hard time identifying that as their property. Give us sense. an example. I think that's a really good point. Brian mentioned earlier that 
we have systems set up that in the past were not networked, but now are. Everything from cameras in front of ATMs to streetlight cameras to triggers for banks who are, that are withdrawing money at certain times of day to police department databases. All of these different pieces of information are being connected in ways that weren't initially envisioned, mm -hmm. but when put together can create some very coercive systems. One way to push back on that is to ensure that people have the right to control who has access to their information. You're starting to see this with companies like Facebook, companies like Twitter, companies that currently have large stockpiles of very sensitive user information, and people are becoming rightfully concerned about how that information is going to be used. Mm -hmm. If we're going to protect Oaklanders' privacy, we're going after, essentially, their data privacy in a large respect. And one thing we can do moving forward is try to figure out a way here at the local level where we can ensure that people who are operating as agents or in concert with the city not just protect Oaklanders' data rights via use policies, but also help Oaklanders understand that these are rights that they need to work to protect themselves. Joe, as the staff person uh, liaising with this commission between other city employees and, and the commission, it sounds like there could be uh, some tiptoeing that might need to be done and or relationships built with other departments. Mm -hmm. um, as Brian mentioned, you're, you're, you found out in 2000, well in 2014, you found out that in 2006, so for all of those years, something was happening within the police department. Can you quickly tell us how the interdepartmental relationships work with your commission? Yeah, I think that's the most important part of our work uh, from, from my perspective as the staff to the, to the commission. When we started the debate around the DAC, I met with the police department, city clerk, fire department, city attorney, uh, IT, because this was a technology thing, and they were talking over here, and the advocates and the concerned citizens were screaming over here, you know, let us in. And bringing them together uh, did a few things. It demystified uh, each side, and it actually showed that there weren't two sides. This, this mm -hmm. was a collaboration. And we tried to keep that going when we created the Privacy Commission. Uh, by having police personnel or Department of Transportation staff or fire inspectors talking with a commission, meeting with them, not just at the meetings, but in between meetings ad hoc, going over policies together, you, you create a sense of trust and an understanding of exactly what the goal is for the department and what the importance of privacy is to the resident. And by bringing that together, you have an outcome where this commission has supported, I think unanimously, every technology that the department's brought forward. They've said, okay, let's do it, but we, we're gonna do it together. And I think that togetherness, that collaboration is, is, is the key to our success. Well said, and a good place for a break. Join us in a few moments when we get back with Inside City Hall. Hi, my name is Ivana Caceres, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement with the Mayor's Office in the City of Oakland. I'm here to invite you to apply for our boards and commissions. We have about 35 of them, and we believe there's a board or commission for everyone, and we really wanna make sure that our boards and commissions reflect the diversity of Oakland. So how do you apply? You head to our city's website, you'll see boards and commissions, click on that. That page will have a listing of all of our boards and commissions, and you'll be able to see uh, what the requirements are, what the meeting times are, if there are any vacancies. Um, read through those, see which ones interest you, and you can apply for one of them by clicking on the green apply button, or you can apply for a few all at once. You'll be asked to submit your resume as well as a couple sentences of why you're interested. And then once you hit submit, we'll get uh, the application and you'll get a confirmation that you've applied. It takes about two to three months uh, for us to review the application. The review is handled by either the staff liaison to the board or the board chair or nominating committee. And they're just trying to see that uh, your interests match up and also your qualifications match up with the requirements of the board. That then gets sent to the mayor and I. Uh, we prepare a letter of appointment, she'll sign it, and then the ultimate approval and vote um, is done by city council. Then the city clerk's office helps you get sworn in and sign any necessary paperwork. So we wanna encourage you to apply 
there is a board and commission for everyone. Uh, we definitely want people who uh, want to help local government and believe in local government. Um, boards and commissions work on things that Oaklanders care about, whether it's libraries, um, parks. Uh, there are a number of boards that were created by voter mandates. For example, Measure H uh, created the Sugar Sweetened Beverage Tax Advisory Board. Uh, Measure LL created the Police Commission. Uh, but ultimately, uh, each board has its own unique set of requirements and we're really seeking folks from all sorts of uh, life experiences and backgrounds to be a part of each board. So again, we encourage you to apply and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to the mayor's office and myself. So we hope to see you and your application uh, coming in and then you'll be able to join the 300 plus team of excellent volunteers for the city of Oakland. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. Once again, we are joined by the Privacy Advisory Commission. We've been talking a lot about the nuts and bolts of your commission, and I think we've been getting some really good information out there for the folks to understand. Now I'd like to pivot a little bit and talk about you as the individuals. Who are you? Why did you join this commission? What, what called you to serve? All of these positions are volunteer. You're all working, and you give up your time to host board meetings, partnership with, uh, or partner rather with other departments. What makes you give up your time to do something like this? For me, it was really, it was the Domain Awareness Center project. Um, I worked around city center at various offices and just kind of stared out the window at the Occupy kids and, you know, was just confused. You know, what's going on? Where is this going to go? You know, what's the goal? What's the end game? And the combination of Edward Snowden and the DAC hitting at approximately the same time is, is finally motivated me to, you know, I keep saying I was like literally the guy that walked in off, uh, you know, from the couch. Uh, I'd never been inside City Hall for any reason. Um, I think I'd lived in Oakland at, at about 15 years at that point. Never wow. talked to an elected official, didn't know how to lobby, didn't, you know, definitely didn't know how to handle the media or anything like that. And, um, you know, somehow just, ended up leading this coalition to really to educate the public and the council about the dangers of this project. And um, then just started serving on the ad hoc committee and just caught the bug, just wanted to keep doing it. And we turned this, you know, into a, a permanent thing. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to now, you know, I go and consult across the country on this type of stuff. So. Oh, wow. Nothing in my past. I mean, I care about politics and I read the newspaper, but I've never been an activist. I had no civil liberties training or anything like that. I just kind of fell into it because I cared. And I really do think, you know, you were talking about the trends. Um, we're heading into the smart city world, whether we like it or not. And I think w that's got a lot of potential for abuse mm. just because of the sheer amount of data that we're going to be collecting. And like Henry was saying about like Facebook and Twitter, it's like we're going to voluntarily turn over a lot of data because we want the benefit, right? We want the utility from these projects, but that's also going to be surveillance and where police could go or hackers could go or stalkers, you know, there's going to be that. And so I kind of think this is the, the future of the hot button issue. Reen? Uh, for me, I think a, a lot of my awareness around surveillance really uh, came from a post 9-11 environment as a Muslim American growing up here and uh, it wasn't really until uh, I started working with clients that were directly impacted by uh, national security surveillance policies you know people who uh, got questioned at the airport extra and somehow those notes could end up in other federal agencies' hands or, you know, feeling like um, they, they were under extra scrutiny mm -hmm. because of who they were. And, uh, you know, my involvement with Oakland, you know, Brian mentioned catching the bug. I ended up showing up to an Oakland privacy working meeting and he gave me the bug. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this was right before the commission had been created. And so that was something that I was really excited about because there is a really large and diverse Muslim community in Oakland and uh, people are afraid to talk about it you know when you're under scrutiny you don't feel like you have you don't always feel like you have the agency to push back or insist that you have privacy rights when you feel like you know you're having to justify your role in this country or justify um, 
justify that you're a contributing member or that you're not a threat in some way. And so that's what really motivates me to this. Wow. Henry. I grew up in Mountain View, California, which for those familiar with the development of Silicon Valley is Google's backyard now. It's the center of Silicon Valley, San Jose and the South Bay. What I remember growing up was seeing how some of the companies we think of today as household names started and the promises they started with. Companies like Google that promised to allow ease of access to information from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Companies like Facebook that started with the promise to connect you to people you care about. You know, all of these benefits that seemed like such great things and it's really easy to buy into that promise. When I was in high school they installed free Wi-Fi for the city of Mountain View. That's a great benefit if you're a high schooler. All of a sudden your parents aren't getting on you for running up a cell phone bill. But years later, you can easily look back and see that the great promise that some of these companies create can easily be turned against mm -hmm. us. Look at the National Security Agency and the Snowden disclosures that Brian mentioned earlier. Some of this technology can easily be turned into systems of mass surveillance that far outstretch anything envisioned in books like 1984. The, the big brother that people have been so concerned about in the past, we created that and we opted into it in a way that people probably didn't expect. Mm -hmm. I got into this because democracy is a team sport and you can't complain if you're sitting on the sidelines, you have to jump in and get involved. So I decided to get involved and I wanted to use some of my background. I went to law school at Santa Clara and while I was in law school I took some classes on internet law. I thought about becoming a certified privacy professional, but I haven't done it yet. I'm gonna have to turn around and get that credential because these issues are really important. You know, data privacy, data rights, ownership of your personal identifiable information, that is the greatest resource this valley is creating right now. And if we're not careful, we're gonna give away too much of it before it's too late. Joe, you couldn't really opt in. You are a staff member. What brought you or what attracts you to being part of city government in your role, but then extending yourself to be the liaison with this committee? Well, I think something Henry said is great, <clears throat> that democracy is a team sport. Uh, I really believe in participatory democracy, and there's no place where you have more participation than at a board or commission providing direct input to our departments and to our elected officials on how we do business. Mm -hmm. uh, we can complain about the federal government, we can complain to our Congress member, we can complain to our U.S. Senator. Uh, I dare you to write a letter to the President. It really doesn't do a lot of good, it doesn't feel very good, but here we can actually make a difference working together, and I love that. Um, the other thing with the privacy work and with the controversy, um, I love s problem solving. I love getting down and dirty into an ugly problem where people are, 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 are warring and, and trying to find ways to bring them together. And when you look at how we started uh, back in 2013 or 2014 to where we are now, uh, we, have, we have solved this problem. We have shown that people can have uh, different interests and come together and, and have a final product that works for everybody. And, and that just excites me because that's, to me that's good government uh, and that's what we're paid to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that job any day. I have to agree with you, Joe. I think that the local government is where it's at as far as getting yourself involved. It is really the one of the only places where you can actually see the change and your voice can be heard. How can our viewers get involved with the commission? What advice would you give to someone who might not have had any kind of background but wants to have, wants to be part of something like this? I could jump in on that. Practice corporeal politics. Practice. Sh corporeal politics. By that I mean show up. Put your body in a place where you can be seen and heard. Okay. In this case, we meet once a month. Show up, write in, do public comment online if you can't make it to the meetings. But step one is just to put yourself in a place where you can be seen and can be heard. And our commission's created a forum for members of the public to do just that. They'll find themselves surrounded by other people with similar concerns, mm -hmm. subject matter experts, members of city staff, everyday activists who are just interested in the ideas. But step one is really just showing up and starting to see who's in the room and who can connect you to more information. And all of our information for this commission is on our website. Uh, so you can go on to the city of Oakland's, uh, oaklandca.gov 
and find out more information about any of our boards and commissions. The descriptions are there, the vacancy numbers are there, and when they'll, the seats will be up, that information is on board as well. I want to thank you all very, very much. This is an interesting conversation. I feel like we can continue to talk, so I will probably hold you hostage after the taping so that we can chit-chat some more. Brian Hofer, Reem Suleiman, Henry Gage, and Joe DeVries, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of Inside City Hall. We look forward to seeing you soon.